Did you know that 73% of prospective employees won't apply or accept a position at a company that doesn't offer modern work experiences? If you want to learn more, visit vmware.com forward slash employee dash experience. But I'm going to give you another reason to visit that page, and I have to confess that this is one of the coolest podcast sponsorships I've done with my friends at VMware because they are actually giving away copies of my upcoming book, The Future Leader. And this is where I interviewed over 140 CEOs around the world to figure out what it will take to be a leader in the next decade and beyond. They're giving away a limited number of copies. So if you want one for free, then again, make sure to check out vmware.com forward slash employee dash experience to claim yours. You'll hear a lot, and you know, I'm sure on your podcast, this idea of being bold. You don't actually need to be bold. <laughs> you need to be brave, right? And you need to take the first step towards a change. And and I see that in the context of transformation, you know, digital or otherwise, any types of bi business transformation, even personal transformation, it's the first step that's the hardest. When you think about it's that first workout that's the hardest. It's the first you know investment you make that's the hardest. And so I would say that's the biggest challenge that I would tell people. It's it's an easy challenge to overcome. Just take your first step, bigger, bigger, small. Just take a step and and see how it goes. And and you might find that it's not as bad as you think. And you might actually get some results that, that will inspire you to take a bigger step next time. But don't let paralysis you know, be the enemy. That's Chuck Kosel, the Chief Transformation Officer at Deloitte Tax, the tax function of the global firm Deloitte. They were actually named America's Tax Technology Firm of the Year for the second year in a row by the International Tax Review. In our discussion today, you will hear some examples of the advanced technology Chuck and his team are using to ensure that they provide the best service possible. Part of Chuck's role is to help the organization navigate change and transformation, and you will hear some of the changes they are currently going through, including their move from doing digital to being digital. You will also hear what Chuck believes is the biggest mistake or pitfall that organizations make when going through digital transformation and how to overcome that. He also shares some of the big trends he's paying attention to, the role that empathy plays in business, how to keep up with new technologies without getting overwhelmed, and much more. I think that's the, when we talk about future of work, it's interesting that, that there's a, a tendency for a lot of people to think that means less people. That, that's not what future work means at all, you know, and, and, and it's again, how do you, how do you actually, you know, from our perspective, when you think about the tax in 2020 strategy, it's a redeployment strategy. We, 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 we receive the question all the time. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean you're going to reduce your headcount? No, absolutely not. We, we think we can actually, we can redeploy our people to doing, you know, uh, more valuable work for our clients and actually more fulfilling work, you know, for them personally. And so it's absolutely a redeployment, you know, that the build out of our, of our globally integrated platform is actually going to help us with our people and our clients. It's not going to actually reduce the amount of people we have. This is Jacob Morgan, best-selling author, speaker, and futurist. Welcome to the Future of Work podcast, where every week I speak with C-level executives, business leaders, and authors to explore how the workplace is changing and what the future of work is going to look like. The goal of this show is to give you the insights, the ideas, and the inspiration to help future-proof your career and your organization. If you want to get access to more content, such as podcast transcriptions and information on working with me or having me keynote your next event, you can visit my website at thefutureorganization.com. If you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses that explore these themes in more depth, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. Also, if you get a few seconds, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or whatever your preferred channel is. It really helps the show and I personally appreciate it since the podcast does take quite a bit of effort to produce. In case you're interested in sponsoring the podcast or working with me, my email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Future of Work podcast. My guest today is Chuck Kosel. He is the Chief Transformation Officer at Deloitte Tax. Chuck, 
Thank you for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. So I got to ask, you have a pretty interesting job title, Chief Transformation Officer. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, what does a Chief Transformation Officer actually do? Well, maybe I will tell you when I figure it out. Um, uh, it's actually, uh, it's probably the most difficult job I've had uh, in, in my career. Um, uh, at Deloitte, I'm responsible for our strategy, obviously um, delivering against our vision to be the undisputed leader of our profession. Uh, with that comes uh, responsibility over innovation and corporate development, which is really inorganic growth. And it's really the idea of how do we change how we serve our clients. Uh, and today, obviously, the focus of that is uh, in a digital way. And then also, how do we attract and retain the, the, the best and the brightest talent? You know, how do, how do we focus on creating a workspace uh, for our future? And so I, I have a lot of responsibilities with that title. Uh, it seems to change every single day as to, to what I spend my time on, but but that's really the, the summary of what I do. So transformation officer with a transforming job title and function. Makes sense. It, it all Absolutely. fits together. So how did you get involved with this? I mean, we can go back maybe before even Deloitte. Um, how did you become a chief transformation officer? What was your career path that led you up to this? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure I have a career path that uh, logically results in you becoming the chief transformation officer. I actually started uh, my career in the military. I'm a veteran and a proud veteran uh, of the United States Army. Uh, and so I, I, I served four years active duty and, and then went to the reserves and, and went to Michigan State University uh, for my bachelor's uh, and law degree. Uh, and then I became a practitioner at Deloitte Tax, uh, serving you know, large you know, global multinational clients. Um, I, I think the, the role I... Uh, I became qualified for the role because I've been very focused throughout my career on practical applications, you know, actually solution sets, um, figuring out how to make small impacts, uh, how to, to motivate people to change, how to do things different, uh, how to always think creatively around, you know, how we deliver. And and so I think I, I ended up in a really kind of natural way versus maybe the resume way. I don't, you know, I don't have an MBA, um, you know, and I think many of the folks that have roles like mine uh, came through with with a, an experience of doing large transformational type projects before they became the transformation leader. Uh, I think for for our CEO today, Steve Kimball, he was very focused on some of the innovation I'd done and some of the practices I led, and and how we actually were able to uh, not just innovate, but then commercialize and 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 really focus on serving our clients in in a way that resulted in them being very very happy with the value we delivered. So after. Um, after the military, how did you end up at Deloitte and what were you doing right before you were a chief transformation officer? Oh, well, um, it's a great question around how did, how did I end up at Deloitte? And, and, and I often get the question also as a lawyer, how did I end up, you know, kind of working in an accounting firm or a professional services firm other than a law firm? Uh, I will admit that, um, you know, growing up in, in Michigan and, and interviewing out of law school, uh, I wanted to serve the big companies. I wanted to do the really exciting things. And and obviously, you know, the, the public accounting firms uh, locally were, were serving, you know, General Motors and Chrysler and Ford and all the big companies here locally. Uh, and I interviewed with our, our, our tax managing partner you know, the office tax managing partner. And, and he, he shared with me an interesting point, which was when you think about a company's finances and, and their expenses specifically, the, the largest expense for most companies is actually their tax expense. Uh, and, and, and that was actually an interesting draw for me that, that every decision that, that most of our clients think about, actually there's a tax impact that, that is often material. Um, and so that was kind of the, the, the beginning of, of my career. Uh, I did a lot of different things uh, working with Deloitte. And, and most recently I led our NFTS business uh, and our NFTS business is a it's an advisory business a tax advisory business and uh, at Deloitte uh, responsible for doing you know planning and compliance and in, in the partnership space and and you know planning like R&D studies and um, you know, just serving our clients uh, you know where they where they have needs uh, and, and you know, very specific offerings but we were a very innovative group as I mentioned very focused on how we could actually use technology uh, to deliver better you know to deliver more efficiently to deliver really in, in, in much of the area uh, that I worked you know more quickly was very important when you think about I mentioned Mentioned asset management and partnership or pass through, you know, private equity, you know, asset management in particular, looking for uh, how quick can we issue K-1s? How quick can we get shareholder information out to their investors? And and so we, we, we created some really interesting solutions to, to problems that were out there. And, and I think that that was the beginning and, 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 and the journey that brought me to here. Well, it sounds like a, a fascinating journey indeed. Um, so as Chief Transformation Officer, what does a typical day look like for you? And I mean, 
people are even curious from when you wake up uh, do you have a, a a typical day are you dropping the kids off to school are you exercising at four in the morning and then what does uh, your day look like at work and how do you end it well, I should be exercising at four in the morning, and I'm not. That's that's another podcast, probably for another <laughs> another day. We're, we're going to have uh, but, to get you up earlier. Yeah, I, absolutely. <laughs> I do have four kids, so they, they do definitely keep me hopping. And I think one of the great things about the Deloitte organization is the idea of of balance. And and um, and again, it, this sounds a little bit like a um, a little a little bit of a marketing campaign, but it's actually very true. You know, there's there's great flexibility when when I'm home, you know, to to spend my you know my morning getting the kids ready for school and off to the bus and and being able to spend time with them before I get to work. But, but when you get into the question around what does a transformation you know, leader do every day, I, I suspect that everybody that has a role like mine would, would answer it in a very succinct way to say, you know, it's a challenge every single day. I mean, it change is hard. Change is really hard. And as I mentioned early in the podcast, you know, I, I had, I did not anticipate how difficult this role would actually be. Um, you, you, you think, you know, in, in any conversation, people always embrace change. They talk about how they want things to be better, how they want things to be different. But the reality is, you know, often human nature is they want everybody around them to change. They, they think what they're doing is pretty, pretty spiffy. Right. And so, you know, I could share an anecdotal example of, of, of a current technology we have in place that, that, uh, you know, everybody has complained about for a number of years. Uh, we announced that we're going to change it and, and, you know, people scream and yell and drop to the floor and kick and scream like my youngest child, right. That, that, you know, don't take it away from me, this terrible technology, you know, so it's, it's every day is, is spent, um, navigating the organization, navigating the stakeholders, you know, doing audience analysis to, to ensure I understand, you know, what's in it for, for the other side, you know, showing empathy. Uh, and then most importantly, being very specific on, you know, the vision, uh, consistency in, in our messaging and communication and, and doing my best to make sure everybody understands, you know, I, I, I often, uh, use, you know, uh, comparisons to the, you know, to the, to the rowboat, right? Everybody in the boat rolling together will get us where we need to go. And it sounds pretty obvious or, or cliche, but but the reality is if you have one person in the boat that's 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 got their oar in the water, you'll go in circles. And so I spend, you know, long, long days uh, working with all of our stakeholders to ensure that uh, I'm meeting their needs. I'm helping them you know, win in the marketplace, serve their clients, uh, meet all their goals, but also actually you know, change in our business for the better. What are you focusing on now? So as the chief transformation officer, obviously you, you were brought into this role for a reason. What is it that you are transforming at Deloitte? What are you trying to go um, from today to to what? That's a great question. And, and you know, we're very focused on our tax in 2020 strategy, which is really a digital transformation of our business. And, and, and I like the way you asked the question, because what we're trying to go from is doing digital and, and our, our, our to be is being digital. And, and the difference between the two is you know, we have a collection of, of disparate applications that are all individually very, very good. Uh, but what we, what we need to continue to focus on is creating a globally integrated platform where every experience our clients have with, with anybody in Deloitte Tax around the world is the same experience. Uh, you expect that today in, in any interaction you have, you know, from a, from a digital perspective. And so we're very focused on, you know, a reimagination of, of, of our business. And then that includes, you know, how we operate, how we go to market, you know, what services we deliver to our clients. You know, we're very focused on truly, you know, transforming the business. And, you know, that, that's a big change. It's a really big change because, you know, it isn't broken, you know, in today's sense. Like when you think about, you know, any type of snapshot of, of how it looks today, we're doing very well, you know, largest firm in the world. And, 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 and you'd, you'd say, you know, we, 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 we great, you know, compliments from our clients. We always have room to improve, but do we really need to transform? And, and we, we, we believe the answer is absolutely yes. And so we've invested heavily in, in this strategy and it's really what my team is focused on each and every day. So are, are you doing this because customers are giving you feedback or what, like, I'm just trying to understand what are some of the areas that you're transforming? It sounds like making it easier for your customers to do business with you. That's exactly right. And, and it's funny, um, you know, I get that question a lot in, inside the organization. Well, you know, what have our clients said? And, and clearly our clients, when we ask, will tell us that. But if we don't ask, they don't tell us. You know, uh, the reality is what we're really focused on is the rest of the world around us, right? I think the world around us is becoming digital. Our experiences that we have each and every day, how we live our lives is very digital. And, and our expectations are changing. Um, you know, there, there's a phrase out there, um, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'd love to be able to cite the author of the phrase, and I don't remember his name, but he talked about liquid ex expectations. You know, I think there are liquid expectations out there for our clients. You know, when you think about, you know, they're going to move, if, if they're in, in the city, you know, if they're in New York City, and, and they're going to move from 
one of their offices to another and they're going to Uber, their experience of transparency, their experience of, of communications and in the way they operate in that platform, you know, quickly becomes the experience they expect from us. And so I would say in, in, you know, in professional services, you know, I, I think there's still room to go. Uh, and I mean that in the context of public accounting and in, in the legal field um, and, and, and many of the areas of, of true you know, engineering, you know, architecture, all of those businesses, the professional services, businesses, medicine. You know, I think they're, they're all kind of behind the times uh, you know, when you can when you compare them to the digital experiences we have and maybe. Um, you know, B2C you know, world, you know, when, when you expect you, know, what do you expect from Amazon, what do you expect from Uber, as I mentioned. And so I think from our perspective, it's it's not just what our clients are, are telling us and our clients are providing us thematic you know, points of view. They would like to see, you know, they'd like to have more transparency like they experienced with, with Amazon. Like they'd like to have more, more connectivity with us, you know, like they experienced through their use of, uh, you know, their, their, their Apple iPhone or, or, you know, any, you know, Google platform, you know, they, 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 they actually really, expect us to work and operate uh, like everything that they have in their life. And so that's really the focus. It's not just, you know, individual clients saying, hey, I'd like to be served a little bit different. It's the world. It's really the world around us. Do you have a specific example of a particular, and I know this is going to sound weird, but like a particular, I guess you could call it a, a pain point or something that you're working on now that your clients or employees have said, hey, you know what? This is how we're doing things. This is how we want to do it. Um, do you have anything like that that you can share and kind of walk through? Sure. Well, I'm I'm actually very transparent, you know, and and you know, I I want us to be the best, and and um, you know, I think our entire leadership team feels the same way, and so you know, we're we're very transparent on, on the things that we believe we don't do as well as we should. Uh, we've we've received validation. You ask about our clients' points of view. I spend a lot of time with clients doing client sensing, and and you know, one good example is is silly. It's 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 actually it's almost humorous. It, it's it's so you know kind of disappointed in the context of the role I, I sit in, and that is how we collect data from our clients. You know, is is actually uh, a process that's incredibly manual and and you know any use of technology we have might be the microsoft platform when we send an email and say hey could you send us this um so, so you know, what, clients, what type of data would, would you be collecting for example no, fi- you know financial data you know their their, you know, their financial statements their trial balance their you know their their w-2s their 1099s you know anything we need to actually do you know, tax compliance or tax planning or tax advisory work you know to support them in a, in a deliverable that they've hired us to, to generate Got it. um and it, you know it's 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 funny when you you think about it you know we we will have people who will send an information request to a client and then three days later the person in the office next to them will send you know an almost exact replica of that request to someone different in, in our client organization you know, and so that's a pain point. You know, we, we think this idea of collecting data one time and, and providing visibility, you know, to the practitioners that are serving that client so that we can we can reduce the burden on our clients. And I think you said it earlier, and I, I know you're a big advocate of this, you know, the customer experience, the user experience for us must get better. And that, that's a major focus for us. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's a very tangible and I think an example that a lot of people can relate with is just collecting data. <laughs> Simple. Uh, how big is Deloitte Tax? I realized I never asked you about the company itself. So how big is the company and what do you guys specifically do? Although the name, I'm sure, gives it away. Well, uh, you know, we're the we're the tax function uh, of 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 Deloitte. You know, the uh, the global firm Deloitte. Um, you know, and and you know, for the t- tax function specifically, we have about twelve thousand people. Um, you know, around the world. Uh, you know, that's the U.S. You know, the U.S. part of the business that that has people around the world as well. Um, and so it, it's a large organization, and and um, you know, we serve clients. You know, big and small. I mean, I think there's often a view that that uh, we only we only serve the biggest companies in the world. You know, and and that's that's not necessarily true. You know, we do all sorts of services. You know, in the context of you know the obvious types of things like tax compliance. You know, where we do tax returns. Uh, we do things for companies, as I mentioned, where we help them with their credits and incentives that they might need to negotiate with 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 the you know, local governments or federal government. You know, in the context of investments they might make. Uh, we do things like uh, mobility, where we help companies when when their employees you know move. Uh, become expatriates abroad around the world, and and, and obviously that's a it could be a, it could be viewed as a traumatic experience for the employees. We 
help them through that in, in the context of a financial sense. Um, you know, lots and lots of work that we do in the in the tax world. But but one thing we don't you know that that's often misunderstood about our business is you know it's not just tax compliance. You know, that's certainly a big part of our business, you know, which is kind of a regulatory requirement for for every you know company and individual in the in the world. Uh, but but we also do a lot of work around you know M and A and and the idea of potential acquisitions and due diligence and uh, post merger integration when 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 clients you know two clients merge you got to figure out you know where do you centralize how do you actually get the you know the the synthesis of value you know uh, of of combining the two organizations um, we do management consulting you know with with what technology should companies be thinking about using and, and implementation integration services through our tax management consulting business and you know it, it it's it's much more broad than most think but I will admit that most don't understand what we do and including my family and friends ask me repeatedly what I do. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like a fun problem to have though. But that that's good. That means you don't have a routine, a typical uh, a, a typical job, which could make it interesting. Um, do you have things that you do that are also internal focused? So looking at your employees, or is everything customer focused? Well, I, you know, it's a it's a good question. You know, th I think. There's a symbiotic relationship between how we serve our customers and and how we deploy our people and how we train our people and I mentioned attraction and 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 retaining our people, um, you know. So, you know, there's a big part of our project that that also wants to make the experience for our, our professionals better. Um, you know, there's a lot of tedious work that we do, a lot of monotonous work that we do. You know, it's a very very data intensive uh, business that we're in. You know, we 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 receive you know just an enormous amount of data from our clients that we have to to transfer translate into these very complex tax rules and regulations. Uh, and so you know, we are very focused on, on the experience for our professionals as well. Uh, how we help them, you know, I, as it relates to my specific role, you know, my, my group, I have kind of three areas of focus, you know, how we support all of our practitioners uh, in their pursuit of, of you know, wins in the marketplace. You know, how do we help them with, with marketing materials? How we help them with you know, technology to help them in the marketplace? Then specifically, how do we help them become more profitable? You know, we, we, we are running a business and, and, and that's not, you know, something that we're, uh, you know, afraid of admitting, you know, the, the reality is we are, when we serve our clients, we want to do it in a profitable way. And so, you know, my, my group is also very responsible for how do we deploy things like RPA or, or analytics, um, you know, AI or, or cognitive technologies to, to help us become more profitable, uh, to do things more efficiently. And then, as I mentioned, you know, the last thing is, is this idea of, you know, how do we look at inorganic opportunities? How do we look at ecosystems? How do we look at uh, potential alliances out there uh, you know, to, again, help our, our professionals serve our clients in a, in a better way than they have in the past? If you were to look uh, from a, a macro level, just at what's happening in the world of work, what are some of the big trends that you are particularly paying attention to that you think are going to disrupt how work gets done? Well, that's interesting. Um, one of the things that I'm really focused on right now is actually management and and kind of, you know, we, we have seen to, to, to maybe take a step from, you know, a, a small group of visionary, you know, leaders, uh, you know, in, 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 you know, in kind of corporate America or public company or private company America that are trying to be visionary of, of, of how to become more digital or how to get more out of their own, you know, their, their own entity, you know, in, in the context of their own profitability. Uh, and, and, and that continuum or, or that journey seems like we've gotten to a point now where this has become the new normal. You know, how do we get you know, more from less? You know, how do we, you know, a lot of folks in the C-suite have, you know, are hearing about those technologies like artificial intelligence or the robotics process automation, you know, and they're saying, wait a minute, what can what can we do with that? So the trend is it's really important for us, and it's actually a marketplace trend, to be honest with you, for for, for Deloitte Tax, is we have a lot of our clients that are coming to us saying, you know what, we can't invest in all of these technologies. You know, it doesn't make sense for an individual entity to invest in all these types of technologies because they can't get the scale value out of it. And and so how do we partner? How do we work together? How do we how do we work, you know, in, in the context of us doing more you know, for their department or even taking over the department in some cases where we become you know almost a managed service you know um, where we're actually doing the investments but we're also delivering the day-to-day -day work uh, there's another thing that's out there and I'm not sure I would call it a, a trend but it's something I find very fascinating I'd, I'd actually like to hear your perspective on it too um, and that is you know the productivity um, that, that we're getting 
you know, from humans, you know, with, with this, you know, kind of new, uh, you know, accelerated focus, you know, uh, you know, as it relates to kind of Moore's law and, and technology. What I, what I'm finding is that we, we, you know, the technology is helping us be more efficient. Uh, we're certainly, uh, moving things through, you know, moving through things more quickly, but I think our individual, you know, the human part of it is actually becoming less productive. Uh, and it's because of distractions. It's because of, you know, chat, it's because of, uh, you know, instant messaging and, and all the different mediums that are out there that I think, you know, all of our, uh, all of our friends and family love and they're, they're most important things in the world for them. But, 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 but I, I wonder, you know, is it, is it going to have a change in the future work for all of us? Because part of Activity is actually going down a little bit uh, because of all the emerging technologies. I was curious if you had a point of view on that. You know, that's a that's an interesting one, and that that actually comes up quite a lot. Uh, will these technologies make us more productive, or are they more distracting? I think it depends on how you use it. Uh, because the tool is always just a tool, but it's the type of corporate culture that you create. So, for example, I, I saw that um, Microsoft recently, and, and some people may have seen this article, they recently tried a four-day work week in Japan. And they actually found that employees were 40% more productive, which I thought was completely fascinating. So you're, you're working less, but you are actually more productive. And, and why is that the case? Um, well, it's, I mean, if people want to read the article, it's a pretty interesting dive into that. But it just goes to show that sometimes I think we can be a little bit too reliant on technology. And the more of it we have, you know, we always assume we have to be connected and available and we can get burned out and we can get stressed out and we got to just include everybody in the conversation. And then we're just having these big group chats and nothing's getting done. So I definitely see that. That, that absolutely does happen in a lot of organizations. But I think it's also coming down to the cultural aspect of can you give employees more autonomy? Can you give them more freedom? You know, a classic example of where we see this, and you could probably relate to this inside of Deloitte, everybody's always talking about how they can't get rid of all their emails, right? I, I mean, to the point where inbox zero is like a term. It's, it's like a phrase that we use. And whenever I, and people tell me this all the time, oh yeah, I get 500 emails a day, 400 emails a day. And I ask them, well, what, what kind of emails are you getting? Oh, you know, my, my team is CCing me and everything. I got to respond to everything. So when I hear stories like that, that's a classic example of how you're trying to use technology, but you're also not giving your employees more freedom, more decision-making power. If you give employees a technology that connects everybody together, but everybody feels that they always have to CC you and everything, and they always need to include you in everything because they can't make the decisions themselves then the technology is going to be more of a problem than it is a solution. But if you give employees the technology that says everybody can be connected, everyone can share information, but you also have the power to make decisions on your own. You don't need to include me anything in, in everything. You don't need to CC me in everything. I trust you to make these right decisions. Then technology will be more of a, uh, of a benefit instead of a hindrance. So I think it really depends on how we use it. Well, I think that's a really good point. It's funny. I think about, you know, you ask, you know, how did I end up in the role? <laughs> well, I think that's one of the big things is I've always recognized that the technology is a means to an end. Um, you know, it, it's it's part of a solution. It's not the solution itself. And and I think you're exactly right. I think that, that where you see, you know, that disconnect, it's it's where people think it becomes the solution in its entirety. Uh, and we lose that, that empathy. We lose, you know, the, the emotion. We lose the idea of, of creativity. You know, we, we, we lose a lot of the really important you know, parts of the of the process, you know, whether that's the, the creative process, whether that's even the conclusive process, we lose a lot of that because we think we have a solution that is, quote, technology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and this also extends into our personal lives. You know, a lot of people are so addicted to just even social media. Uh, I, I was sharing this story. So I have a, um, a Facebook group that I have of a couple thousand business leaders from around the world. And I shared this story in there. I was at the gym a couple days ago and there was this guy working out there weren't that many people in the gym. It was just me, this guy, and maybe one or two other people because it was, you know, some off hours. And I was amazed because this guy was, he was, he was doing the bench press and he would do a rep and then he would stop and he would take a selfie of himself. And each time he would do a different selfie in a different pose, you know, do a little peace sign, do a little video of him smiling. And then he would put more weight onto the bench press, not actually lift it, but take a picture of himself with the weight. Um, and, and, and it was just, it was completely mind-blowing to me. He was just 
I don't know what what you would even call it. And making it look like obviously he's he's lifting more weight than he's doing, so that the people on social media would say, "Oh my God, you're so strong." But it's to the point where I think technology, social media is is really starting to interfere in our lives unless we start to take control over it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never once uh, done these crazy selfies of myself at the gym and, you know, look how much weight I'm doing. <laughs> Maybe I should start. Maybe that's my problem. Well, is that the way I asked me whether or not I start my day at the gym? It wasn't <laughs> yeah. me. It's sort of, you know, it wasn't exactly. me. <laughs> so, I, mean, no, see- I think the only thing I'd laugh at about that is, you know, the, the you know, the, the food craze, right? People taking pictures of their plates. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's one of those, like, I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand that, but, but people like to take pictures of the food they prepare or the food they're about to eat at a restaurant. That's, and they share it. They post it. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. There's just a lot of technology madness out there. Honestly. I mean, I've seen people walk into poles, fall into fountains because they were staring at their phones. I've seen people almost get hit by cars as they walk into oncoming traffic. I mean, it's just, um, you know, we, we got to take a little bit more control of technology. It, it working in our lives, but you know, I digress. That's a little, uh, tangential story, but, um, I think the behaviors in our personal lives very much translate into what we're seeing inside of our organizations. Uh, but it, going back to your original point, um, I do think that technology can be used either way. I think it can be a massive time suck, but I also think it can be extremely valuable and beneficial depending on on how we decide to use it. So. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I agree, and 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 again, I think that's the when we talk about future of work, it's interesting that that there's a a tendency for a lot of people to think that means less people. That that's not what future work means at all, you know. And 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 it's again, how do you how do you actually, you know, from our perspective, when you think about the tax in 2020 strategy, it's a redeployment strategy. We we we, we receive the question all the time. Well, wait a minute, does that mean you're going to reduce your headcount? No, absolutely not. We we think we can actually we can redeploy our people to doing you know uh, more valuable work for our clients and actually more fulfilling work you know for them personally. And so it's absolutely a redeployment. You know, the, the build out of our of our globally integrated platform is actually going to help us with our people and our clients. It's, it's not going to actually reduce the amount of people we have. I was actually just going to ask you about that because most of the studies that you see, um, and you know, there have been so many of them out there around jobs that are going to be automated and what areas those are going to be in. A lot of those, the studies find, are in tax and they're in finance. Everybody says, oh, if you're in tax and you're in finance, those jobs are going to go away. It's going to be all robots, all technology and automation. But clearly what, what you're saying is that not not the case well you know it's i don't think it's the case now i i'm not going to be naive and and i and i know you also are a big proponent of this idea of of, of disruption in, in your business if you're not disrupting someone will disrupt you and and so i, I don't want to ignore the fact that that the business will change in the short term i don't see that at all you know in the long term as, as we make significant advances with artificial intelligence i'm sure you know that there, there are more and more things that that you know that technology will be able to do that right now people do but but it's it's not something i think is going to happen and and you know kind of the rest of my career you know i I think it's 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 on the horizon and, and it's out there and we should be cognizant of it. We should be focused on it. But I think in the short term, what we're finding is every time we've built you know a really good technology that it's actually helped us with um, again productivity. As I mentioned, you know we can we can deliver faster. We can deliver more you know, business intelligence to our clients. The interesting you know reaction to that is often um, they ask for more for more output. You know, now that you've shown us X, what we'd really like to see is Y. And that Y actually requires us to add 20% of the headcount to the team to actually deliver what they're looking for until we can build out a technology. I think what, what's happening is is the, the needs are changing with the technology. The needs are not staying static. They're also dynamic. And I think that's another thing that people miss frequently when they yeah. have this conversation is is the world isn't staying, you know, standing still while we build, you know, technology to solve all the problems. It's also changing. Yeah, that's that's very true. That's very, very true. I mean, I think Amazon is a great example. Um, they use probably, arguably, more automation and technology than most companies on the planet, but their needs also change. Uh, you know, instead of doing delivery every two days, they're trying to offer same-day delivery. They're expanding into new business models. They're doing all sorts of different things um, while using technology, but they're continuously growing. So th- that's actually a very good point uh, that people do oftentimes forget is that just because we use technology doesn't mean the world stands still and we're just automating things. That the business will change, new needs will emerge, things have to be done faster. Like, uh, it's it's very dynamic. Uh, so that's that's a very very fair point. Today's leading companies understand the importance of enhancing the employee experience to maintain your competitive advantage and to achieve business goals. 
Retaining top talent is absolutely paramount to your success. That's why, and something that I've said many times over the years, is why IT and HR have to partner together to create great experiences for their workers. And if you are ready to separate from the pack, you can start with a report from VMware. And to get access to that report, you can visit vmware.com forward slash employee dash experience. And by the way, on that URL, you can also sign up to get a copy of my upcoming book, The Future Leader, where I interviewed over 140 CEOs around the world to figure out what it's gonna take to be a leader in the next decade and beyond. So if you wanna get access to that report and to get a free copy of my upcoming book, again, the URL is vmware.com forward slash employee dash experience. And now back to the show. So getting back to uh, maybe the the trends, um, were there anything or is there anything else that you're paying attention to? I think you mentioned management. You you mentioned a little bit on technology. You're talking about a few different technologies, though. Are there any particular ones that are catching your eye more than others? Well, you know, I'm my eye is always focused on on real practical solutions. So, you know, I hear a lot about quantum computing. Um, someone actually tried to explain to me what it was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago I had in San Francisco. Um, I'm glad that there are smarter people on the planet than me, so they can they can work in, in that space because it was very complicated. But but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, right? Because it, you know it is it is the future. But I want to focus on what we can use now. And so you know, my eye is entirely on those technologies that actually can can create practical solutions. Solutions, you know, to, to today's problems, you know, and so what I would say is, you know, there's a lot in 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 the tax business where you know, we'll see press releases, we'll see announcements around how AI has done this or AI has done that, you know, it, in the reality of of what we do, if you actually don't make you know a problem go away, then then it's just a shiny object, you know. I would say right now RPA, you know, is is something that's obviously um, you know kind of on the tip of everybody's tongue in the, robotic, in the tax business. Robotic process automation for people who don't. That's I'm assuming what you're referring to. Right? Yep, absolutely, yes, and 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 it's 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 kind of one of those what I, I would describe as an interim solution set, right? It's it's you know it's not fixing the you know the, the disease. It's it's fixed you know it's 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 treating a symptom of a disease, right? So if if our clients have bad data, uh, you know, or or we're working in a process and we have to do you know a manual manipulation of that data repetitively for for in some cases weeks and weeks, you know, with individuals, you know, we can actually you know train a, a, a bot, you know, to actually do that, and so. In in the context of, of of today, you know, RPA is is re- relatively hot. Um, AI is certainly there. You know, we we've got some great practical applications where we're using artificial intelligence to uh, to an, analyze things like indirect tax reporting. You know, should you pay sales tax on uh, on, on on an asset to, or not, to, or on a purchase or not, uh, or on a sale or not, depending on where you are in, in the in the continuum. And so, you know, I, I think artificial intelligence is, is probably our, our, you know, I don't want to say frontier because it's here. It's it's right now. It's maybe the next step. Uh, and so th- those are the ones I'm really focused on, you know, RPA and, and cognitive you know, technologies like artificial intelligence. How do you keep up with all the technologies? This is actually a very common question that I get asked from either business leaders or even from individuals. There is so much technology that's floating around out there. And... As business leaders, I mean, as a, as a chief transformation officer, obviously you can't invest in every single technology all the time when something new pops up. So what what is your process like? What is your thinking like for deciding which technologies to focus on? Do you just do like a bunch of experiments all the time? Like how, how do you approach this constantly changing landscape? That's a great question, and 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 it's something that that we we spend a lot of time thinking about because you you don't want to create a process that stifles potential innovation, yet at the same time you could do a whole bunch of experiments. In fact, if if you let you know, uh, many people in the world today, you know, if you gave them a, a blank check, they would they would experiment all day long, all, all weekend long, you know, and and never actually get anything done. So there's great balance in this idea of of you know what we do in our processes. We 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 look again. What is the solution? You're you know, what is the issue you're trying to to, to fix? 
what is the problem what's the client's problem you know what do we think the potential solution might be and what what p- potential applicable technologies exist to actually fix that problem it's not always technology it's today it's most often technology but it's not always technology um, and and so we look at that and then we begin to, to do a little bit of what I consider to be a modular approach like is there a way for us to build a proof of concept and work with our clients uh, often we do co-development you know where we actually work directly with a client to say let's work together side by side because another thing that's very very important and again this is coming from a guy who grew up you know uh, as a tax lawyer um this idea of use cases you know real use cases versus an experiment a lot of experiments that are done there actually aren't use cases there's hypothesis or there's a potential you know thought of where application might apply but but there's not a use case and so i'm very very focused with our team to make sure that we have a real pragmatic use case to, to make sure we can test you know as we do our our proofs of concept, you know, kind of the first module of build uh, a, a minimum viable product to say, hey, we actually solved a problem and this was valuable. And so that's how we do it. And, and it's funny, there's some things out there. I, I made light of, of quantum because it's, it's far out there. But, you know, there's other things that have been out there like cloud or uh, excuse me, like uh, blockchain. You know, blockchain is one of those things I, I make a joke all the time about if I if someone would give me a dollar for every time someone came to me and somebody to blockchain, I would just retire right now. Um, but but you know it's a it's a it's an interesting technology and, and the use cases are are a challenge you know they're a challenge and, and people will talk about different things that have happened out there in the world but uh, good luck finding real practical applications you know in my business in particular uh, that's really valuable for our clients and then by the way not just valuable but also cost you know. You know, there's a cost consciousness that goes into that because the you know, the build can be very very expensive. So you could create you know the, the proverbial you know, sled, sledgehammer to push an attack. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I, I guess would blockchain be an example of a technology that's maybe interesting, but you wouldn't prioritize investing in that one versus, for example, robotic process automation. Well, I, that's a that's a real that's a loaded question. Actually, I'm sure that there's folks out there, including you know, we have folks at Deloitte who spend all their time in that space, um, that would say, "Oh no, no, you, you've lost your mind. This is the best investment we could make." Um, so I might answer it in a very personal way versus you know on behalf of Deloitte Tax and say, for me, you know, I want to understand a, a a viable use case for our business uh, of how we would serve our clients with a you know an open or closed blockchain that the government will accept, uh, and then I'm, I'd be I'd be all in, you know. But um, those are a lot of inputs or variables that are incredibly important that, that to date we haven't found um, you know a great application you know for those um, I will tell you that we do a lot of work as an organization supporting companies who have found use cases you know, whether it's the cryptocurrency world uh, we have a whole practice that focuses their attention on how to help those companies you know, navigate when you, you talk about new currencies think about in the tax world that we live in the challenges that come with that how do you tax new currencies you know, what what is income what is what is an asset um, you know, is this equity or is this is this compensation you know just all sorts of different questions that, that pop out there that you know are uh, our people need to help our our crypto clients with, um, and so you know there's things out there in the in, in the space, you know, kind of the blockchain and broader space when you get into crypto that are relevant. But just for for me personally, um, I, I'm still looking for a a very practical use case uh, that I would deploy. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, earlier, you also mentioned something interesting, which was dealing with change. And you didn't actually specify the technology, but you said that you guys, I think, were replacing a technology and you had a bunch of people kicking and screaming like your kids uh, who didn't want it to be <laughs> be replaced. Can you share a little bit more about that? And how do you actually deal with change? Well, it's, you know, it, 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 you know I, I certainly am not an expert on it. Um, it's something I work hard at every single day. And, and, and that spe- specific fact pattern, I think that the actual technology itself is actually a little bit of red herring. I think the point is that, that I think it, it ties back to productivity conversation we had. People are so busy and, and, and they have so many, you know, every single moment they have, you know, five, 10, 12 screens open on their machines. We have multiple monitors. You know, they, they have a, a busy day. They have personal life commitments. And and when they see change, they see disruption. And and I think the biggest challenge is that, you know, the disruption is probably accurate. But the point is in, in the long term, or even arguably in the medium term, you'll end up with a better situation. But people are very myopically focused on the pain of the day, the pain of the change period. You know, and so it's, it's really not so much that anybody would debate, hey, we need a new technology to do what that does. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of people would applaud it. Um, they just don't want to endure 
you know, the, the, the pain that will come with the, you know, the idea of deployment, you know, this idea of migration and deployment and, you know, um, the setup and pilot and all the different steps that go through, you know, a transformation like this. Uh, and so I think that's the real, that's the real issue is, is you know, how do you try to limit you know, the pain for the user, whether that's a client, whether that's our professionals, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I think that's the biggest barrier for change. And also how will that impact them individually? I mean, the, the, the idea of not, not thinking about what's in it for them, that's a big miss. Folks that are in the transformation business. If you don't, if you're not cognizant of thinking all the time about that question, what's in it for them, what's in it for me, you know, in the context of your user group, you're going to fail. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, so, do you have any, um, I don't know, techniques or things that you use to deal with that change? So, what, what you know, when people are upset by it, like you said, a lot of people might applaud a new technology or a new change or a new process, but they don't like going through that actual change. And the quote that I always like to use, which somebody shared with me, I think a couple of years ago, was that nobody actually likes getting or driving or flying to Disneyland, but everybody likes Disneyland once they're there. So how do you deal with the pain of, of getting, of getting to that change? Well, um, again, I, I'd love to tell you I have a magic solution, um, but but you know I'll tell you what I attempt to do, and that is you know to, to ensure that I assess. I mentioned earlier, you know, the stakeholders and, and the audience and and those impacted, and to give them a voice as to what it is that they need, because there's a lot of things we can actually do with the change that we can excite them about. Uh, it's a balance, though, because you know if you if you if you try to bring everybody you know quote under the tent, you know, you end up being paralyzed, right? Because you know it's interesting when we talk about you know a willingness to change, uh, a willingness to, to try something new. Uh, you know, uh, there was a, there was a, a great quote from you know one of the old movies. Everybody's different. I'm not. You know. Um, I think that's the that's the point is how try to get them in and, and give them something that they're going to kind of wrap their hands around to say that's mine and there's a sense of ownership. I, I think the the most important aspect of that is is that sense of ownership in the change. It's it's them wanting to change versus us changing them. And so I think that education, that communication, and it's really hard. It's really hard you, you, if you get too far ahead of it, uh, you create you know kind of empty you know empty expectations you know where people are waiting for this change they keep hearing about, right? And then they start to to to, to distrust the, the change that might be coming. Um, and so you know it, it's it's certainly one of the biggest challenges that we have in in our strategy. Uh, but I think every transformation officer out there who, who who pays attention to this would agree that that you really have to you have to you have to thread the needle. You know, you have to thread the needle in the context of of getting the sense of ownership, put a great communication strategy together, ensuring that you answer that question, what's in it for me, uh, and, 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 and actually having them drive it versus actually feel like it's happening to them. Which other teams do you work with? Uh, so, for example, do you work closely with, with HR, with IT, with, with operations? Are you kind of like the, the secret task force that sits in between all these? Yeah, we do. We work together with all of them. I mean, I think our, our talent leader is very focused in what we're doing. You know, our ops leader is focused. They, that's interesting. You know, when, when we talk about it, what's in it for me, you know, it's what's in it for both of those leaders, our, our chief you know, talent officer, our chief operations officer is different. It's very different. Right. And so, you know, obviously the, the chief operations officer is focused on the bottom line and, and that's the job he has. And our chief talent officer and his team, you know, they're, they're very focused on, on, again, the idea of, of attracting and, and again, retaining the, the best and bright talent, um, you know, in, in the right training, the right in, environment. Um, you know, we, we do a talent survey in our organization. We want to make sure that that people are, are proud to be part of our organization. They enjoy being part of our team. Uh, and so how, how are, are the transformation? How are the changes that we're doing? How are those things actually, you know, Know, serving you know their needs in the town organization and there's lots of others that 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 are impacted by this you know it's our, our individual business owners you know the, the the idea of they have their own goals they have short-term goals they have long-term goals they have you know they want they have people they want to promote they have people that they want to to give raises to and and so you know it, it, it's it's it, it takes a village you know it, it really does and um if you find as as the leader of a transformation like this that you're only focused on one if you're only focused on the operational impact you will you will struggle if you're only focused on you know making all the you know talent folks happy, but there's there's no you know uh, you know uh, quantifiable benefit as it relates to the operations of your business, you're also going to struggle. So you better figure out a way to to make sure that that the the community is is with you together and, and you're communicating you know each and every day on on the key decisions. You know, I I, I one thing I really emphasize. Um, I, I often tell our leadership team, it's my job to facilitate the discussion, right? It, it's your your job to make the decisions. And and so I can make a recommendation based on what I know. You ask about you know, technologies and, and, and you know, different uh, strategic 
ways to do things. And, and I certainly will make those recommendations. But we as a leadership team, you know, and specifically the business owners need to kind of make the decision, you know, to make the choices. Yeah, no, fair enough. And I, I, I like that. I think that's a very good thing for a lot of people, not, not even in transformation roles, but something that probably people in other roles can uh, can apply as well. Would you say that a lot of your um, job is focused specifically on transformation as it pertains to technology, or are you also looking at other areas as well? I would say that that um, you know, today a lot of it is technology focused, but 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 I actually think that when I answer that way, you know, we may artificially limit you know the, the the reach of technology. I mentioned you know technology is is a solution or a potential opportunity to do a lot of different things. Different, you know, I mentioned how we go to market. You know, we we need to work you know with our clients. You you know on the front end front end of of, of potential um, you know, collaboration in a different way. You know we can't go with the monolithic. You know here's a 50 page PowerPoint. You know uh, you know presentation. I'm going to take you through. Let's now flip to page 35. Like the world is changing, and so there's a lot of things we do that it's not about building you know a blockchain or not about oh we built this amazing bot. You know every day there's small victories as well uh, where we actually change as I mentioned how we operate or we change you know kind of what we offer you know a big focus for our clients right now is, is their own digital transformation that's a much more consultative type relationship with our clients than it is a solution set uh, conversation with our clients hmm. earlier you also mentioned empathy and that's not something that you hear i mean you're starting to hear it more in organizations now but you, you don't hear it often and so i was really curious the role that that empathy plays maybe for you personally and is this something that you teach your team is this like a, a conscious discussion that you're having um my, if my team listens to this they're going to be laughing out loud right now because i'm dogmatic with this principle um I, I share with them every single time i have a bad you know experience you know with a with a service provider um and 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 and, and try to talk about you know situations where maybe we were on the other side of that you know that maybe we did the same type of thing and you know i'll share a story i won't i won't call it my service provider but you know an example where i needed you know a quote service and and i called and, and i talked to somebody and, and they said well hey you know i'm not the right person call back and, and ask for this person and you know i found myself you know spending you know two hours playing phone tag calling different different folks within the same company they all work for the same company you know and and so this is you know this is parts this is service this is you know this is sales these are all these different people and so you know i'm very very focused on this idea of empathy you know and, and understanding um you know how we impact our clients lives how we make their lives better and, and and how we make their jobs easier, how we make them look good um, and, and ensuring we really understand those things. You know, I, I do think that there was a period of time, you know, in the professional services profession where, you know, when you think about you know, market crashes, you know, um, you know, the financial services market crash, you know, some of the reactions that you saw was actually to to try to make things more efficient, you know, try to make things um, you know, tight, tighten up, so to speak. And often when, when you see organizations do that, the pain is actually not felt by the professionals in the professional services organization. It's actually felt by your clients, right? We, we start pushing work to them, you know, like to actually help us help you do work. And so I'm incredibly focused on, on, on our client experience. And, and then again, the empathetic view around what it feels like for them when they get that same information request for the third time in two weeks. Uh, how do they feel about that? And so, yes, it's something we talk about every single day. Uh, I, you know, the outside in perspective is, is incredibly important. Uh, I spend a lot of my time doing client sensing. In fact, next week I'll be in Florida with, with 25 clients, you know, sitting together, you know, going through our, our, you know, kind of what we've done so far as it relates to our 2020 strategies to say, Hey, are we hitting the mark? Is this how you want to be served? What would you do different? What would you say would look, what would better look like? What could we do uh, to actually make your job easier? That's incredibly important to me. And we've all been there, right? I mean, I've, uh, oh man, this week, last week, I've had so many of those phone calls where you spend forever trying to get somebody on the phone. They tell you they can't help you. Um, they, they don't have access to the right technology. You got to call another department, but they happen to be closed right now. So you got to wait, you know, over the weekend, wait for Monday, call back between 95. And uh, at that point, you just kind of want to punch your wall. And it's yeah, uh, absolutely. 
it's, it's completely bonkers. I have great respect for you know, and I, and I could I could give an example, one that I, I really I call out a lot actually, and that's you know Delta Airlines. You know, I travel obviously frequently for 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 work. You know, and and I, I live in Detroit. You know, Delta Hub. You know, I so I fly Delta all the time. And you think about what they've done from their digital you know kind of investment and and the way they've created a level of transparency and and, and communication with me. Hey, your flight's on time. Here's the gate. Hey, your bag's been loaded. You know, I've stood on stage at Deloitte. You know, Deloitte events. And I've, and I've done a great you know, kind of uh, act out of, of you know, this idea of losing a bag, what it was like. You, know, you walk into the, to the bag room and you know, the person behind the counter bangs away at a keyboard. You have no idea what they're doing. They're just banging away at a keyboard, right? You haven't actually given them any information. You're just standing there, but somehow they're banging away. And then they tell you your bag's lost. You know, and then they ask you what color it is, right? And, and it's just you know, that experience you know, used to be so painful for a frequent traveler. And you think about the improvements that Delta made. And, and I'm sure I don't, I don't travel the other airlines as much. What did they do, by the way? I, I, yeah, I don't fly Delta either so i'm curious what what did they do so they you know they are completely digitally connected now with their passengers and and so you know, i i you know i'm actually on a flight to seattle this evening uh i will get a notification probably in the next 30 minutes to tell me my flight's on time what gate it's at um to the extent that i was to check a bag you know every time throughout the process they use a scanning technology to tell me your bag's gone into the turnstile your bag's been loaded you know to the to the cart your bag's now being shipped up the plane it's on the plane it came off the carousel it's on carousel too and i'm getting push notifications for each one of those and so there's a there's a level of of of, of comfort that comes with knowing, you know, I shouldn't worry about it, but you kind of do. <laughs> like subconsciously, you kind of do. And and so this idea, hey, your flight's been delayed 15 minutes. Hey, you can now track the plane that's flying in. You know, you're, you're sitting in an airport in, in Atlanta and, and you're trying to get from Atlanta to Detroit and your flight's delayed. Well, the flight is coming from Dallas to Atlanta and it's going to arrive in 42 minutes. Like, so just complete transparency, good or bad. Sometimes it's frustrating because they're telling you, guess what? Your plane isn't in the air yet. And so uh, the real difference though, when you think about the customer side of it is, you know, if I was to get that same message today, say that we're delayed an hour, guess where I'm not going to sit for an extra hour. That's yeah. in the airport. I'm going to sit at home, right? And so that that's just a you know that's that's a just a, a, a it's a minor or maybe major depending on where you're where, 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 how you look at it but it's just a, a real focus on me trying to make the experience better for me trying to make that trip down to Disney World you're talking about better for me and and I, I applaud organizations out there and, and there's a bunch of them who've really invested in in, in empathy and, and and the idea of trying to make my my experience a better experience. Got it. No, that's a good story. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, so maybe I'll ask you this one uh, one final question before we jump into a couple of fun ones. Uh, what are some of the big mistakes or pitfalls you see from leaders or organizations, broadly speaking, that are trying to make some sort of transformation happen but struggle? Are there any uh, common mistakes? Yeah, you know, I have one top of mind. Um... And, and it's you know it's it's really this idea of taking that first step you know um, and and so you'll hear a lot and and you know I'm sure on your podcast this idea of being bold you don't actually need to be bold <laughs> you need to be brave right and and you need to take the first step towards a change and and I see that in the context of transformation you know digital or otherwise any types of bi business transformation even personal transformation it's the first step that's the hardest when you think about it's that first workout that's the hardest it's the first you know investment you make that's the hardest. And so I would say that's the biggest challenge that I would tell people. It's it's an easy challenge to overcome. Just take your first step, bigger, big or small. Just take a step and and see how it goes. And and you might find that it's not as bad as you think. And you might actually get some results that that will inspire you to take a bigger step next time. But but don't let paralysis you know be the enemy. Don't don't let this idea of you know how change might you know, what the outcome of change might be to not actually try it. And so I, I would say that's it. It's it's take that first step. Got it. Simple enough. So you find that a lot of a lot of organizations or people, they talk about it, but they never actually do anything with it. They admire the problem. You know, they admire you know, the challenges, <laughs> right? And and yeah. and then you sit around the room and you beat up you know the problem and, and and again a lot of different ways and and you 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 actually reach great consensus that there's a problem. But then no one really wants to take a risk. You know, no one wants to actually take that first step. Um, and there, and there, you know, there's fear, fear of change, fear of failure. You know, fear of failure is huge in transformation. Um, and in fact, even with my own you know, team, you know, I, 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 have to, I have to continually you know, reassure them and, and inspire them that, look, what we're doing, we are going to make mistakes. We're not, I'm not perfect. I'm absolutely not perfect. Um, and, and we as a team will make mistakes in what we're doing. In fact, we make mistakes every single day. You know, do we learn from them? Um, do we, we actually, not, if we, you know, as long as we don't repeat them, that's okay. Right. And, and, and how do we apply what we learn, you know, on that next step? And, and so I think that's all okay, but, but boy, when you talk about 
specifically in an organization like ours, you know, uh, the, the immense talent we have, people aren't, aren't actually accustomed to failing. And in transformation, in innovation, you actually fail a lot. You know, it's it's kind of like the you know the baseball average. You're gonna you're gonna fail seventy percent of the time, and and that's not normal for for the people that that you kind of have on your team generally. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, those are wise words. Um, well, to uh, to wrap up, I had a couple fun questions for you. Uh, these are just fun, rapid fire, personal questions about yourself. Starting off with, what has been your greatest failure? My greatest failure. Um, I would say there's been times when, um, you know, and I can think of one in particular because you're asking for a greatest failure um, where you know, I didn't get the most out of a team, you know, a talented team, right? That, that um, you know, I didn't spend enough time on the business chemistry you know, to, to, to understand how they worked, right? And, and, and I, I think this idea, you know, I, I talk so much about empathy and then, and then I use my style, you know, style to kind of command the room and my style was different than their style. I would say it's anytime you don't get the most out of a team, I would put, um, you know, kind of the biggest failure wrapper on that. You know, when you have immense talent and you don't get the most out of it, uh, that'd be a big failure. What is your most embarrassing moment uh, at work? Most embarrassing moment at work. This is supposed to be fun. This was the fun part. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I didn't uh, say it was going to be fun that. for you. It's fun for you all know, of us. I'll tell you listening. that I had one. Um, I had one, and maybe this isn't the failure period, you know. But but um, I, I actually uh, was asked to present at a global leadership meeting, uh, kind of last minute, and and um, you know I, I flew over, landed at six in the morning, was on stage at ten in the morning. You know, forty of our key global leaders, you know, are sitting in front of me in, a, in, a, in a, almost an amphitheater setting, uh, and and didn't have a great day. You know, had 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 a very very tough day, and so that was that was probably my greatest failure. Um, and it's one of those things that's hard to rebound from. From, right when you're leading uh, a big program, you know, like I'm leading, right? It, that those are one of those things that's kind of a challenge to to, to rebound from. And I, I, I survived and I learned from it. But uh, I would guess if, if that's the fun part, that would be it. <laughs> okay, but it wasn't so much embarrassing, was it? Well, it was embarrassing because you know I, I you know I have so much passion and and um, you know and you want them to go so well. I, you know, I guess I, I was personally you know uh, disappointed and. Uh, and, and okay. You know, so from from my perspective, I guess it probably was an embarrassment. But but I, uh, you know, from my my view, you know, I I, I wear I, I carry the weight of the organization on my shoulders. You know, I love the organization, and, I, and I'm so fortunate, so blessed, and you know, they've given me so many great opportunities to do so many cool things like this. And you sure hate to to kind of blow it, right? And so yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. Embarrassment might not be the right word. I have to think about that one a little bit longer, probably. What are you most proud of? Uh, my the proudest thing I would say in an organization like 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 Deloitte and doing what I do is is the growth of of, of people that that you've supported you know in your career I, I think watching people I'm old enough now where I've I've hired kids off campus that are now partners in an organization and and in watching their maturity and and watching their development and 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 watching them take you know have some bad days and and you know sometimes tears in their eyes right and then and working their way through um you know the, our partner mission process and and then standing on stage you know uh, you know being announced as a, as a new partner or principal of organization those days are, are, are you know they bring tears to my eyes it's just incredibly prideful for me because you know how hard people work uh to get there so th th i think for that perspective you're know, watching talent development is the thing i get the most pride out of it professionally what is your favorite business or non-business book that you recommend other people check out um, so I'm going to forget the, 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 um, the author and it'll come to me maybe while I'm speaking and I'm sure you're probably going to know who it is. Uh, getting naked, uh, was a great short book. Uh, can you, do you remember who the author is? Um, I do not, but I can oh, probably cool. check quickly. Yeah. Well, I, I feel bad to, to not remember, but, um, and it's, it's at the tip of my tongue, but it's a great business book about empathy. It's a great business book around, um, this idea of, uh, you know, the bigger you are, doesn't mean the better you are. It doesn't mean you have all the answers. doesn't mean you know more than your clients. And, and, and the idea of actually Patrick making Lencioni. sure. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Quick read, you know, quick, you know, single flight read, uh, great, great business book. I also am a big fan of Daniel Pink. Um, and, and I do think that, um, you know, he, the way he thinks is, is brilliant. And, and I, I, you know, I read everything he puts out. Okay. What is, or actually who has been the best mentor you've ever had? 
So I worked for a partner uh, for a long time in our organization. Uh, his name is Mike Delastrito, and and um, you know he he was just a fantastic mentor in this idea of of always ensuring you understood your goals, and then specifically you know what it takes to get to them, and staying focused, staying driven, and and being very practical every single day. Um, you know, and so he was he was just I always knew I could go to him, good days and bad. You know, and and he would actually you know help me out uh, in the context of of how to be better on my on my best days. Uh, and and how to not get too down on your on your toughest days, you know, and and so you know he still works with me uh, every day, and and um, you know just what he brings to business, you know, there's a common sense that 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 actually, you know, that that actually uh, success is driven by in business that that sometimes we forget, and you know he always was you know there was a level levity with with Mike every single day around let's 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 not make this more complicated than we need to, uh, let's let's actually you know focus on uh, where we're going, focus on you know what is it that we're trying to do, we're, we're trying to solve client problems here uh and as long as we do that we'll win and and you know he was he's always been there for me and and continues to be and very last question for you if you would have ended up doing a different career what do you think you would have ended up doing uh coaching um you know and and you know my my, my son my seven-year-old son would would right now shudder if he heard me say that because I coach his flag football team and, and I think it's, he thinks I'm the worst coach in the planet but uh, you know the idea of, of of leading you know being a leader I hate I hate the idea of management I like leadership you know that's maybe something I learned in the military um, but I think coaching young young folks uh, and again trying to help them reach you know the reach you know, heights that, that they don't even think are possible themselves you'll know, continue to push them without breaking them right I, I think coaching would be incredibly rewarding um, and maybe I still will do it at some point you know in, in my life but uh I think it would be coaching. I think that'd be my thing. I love doing it. I love being on the sideline. I'm, you know, it's my most intense days every single, you know, when, when we're coaching a game and, and, um, you know, making sure that the we're successful and we have fun. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, I have a three-year-old. I try to, well, I'm not coaching a team. I'm just coaching her in soccer, but it's, it's a lot of fun. I, uh, I get into it. So I could definitely see why, uh, why that would be something that you would want to do. Uh, well, Chuck, we are out of time. The hour has gone by so quickly. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you or Deloitte Tax or anything that you want to share? Well, I have a LinkedIn, uh, uh, you know, uh, identity, I guess, you know, so if, if people want to find me on LinkedIn, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn and obviously through our Deloitte tax, uh, dot com, you know, and, and Deloitte.com specifically where, where you'll find us. But I think the, uh, the easiest thing for me to connect with me directly is through LinkedIn or through my email, which is ccozel at Deloitte.com. Um, and so I'd love to hear from anybody if anybody has any questions or any feedback. Uh, and, and, and I hope it's, it's been very transparent and clear. I don't have all the answers. Uh, and so I'd love to get, you know, feedback from people and, and advice from people and not just questions because uh, I can use all the help I can get. So uh, uh, I appreciate your time too. Oh, of course. Thanks for uh, sharing your insights. And I'm sure people want to connect with you. Uh, so thank you very, very much for your time. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again has been Chuck Kosal. His last name is K-O-S-A-L. You can find him on LinkedIn. He is the Chief Transformation Officer at Deloitte Tax. And I will see all of you next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Future of Work podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please do me a favor and rate and review the show on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast platform is. And remember, if you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses based on some of the themes that I explore in this show, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. If you're interested in being added to my newsletter, you can do that by visiting thefutureorganization.com forward slash newsletter. And you can also get in touch with me directly if you have any inquiries for podcast sponsorships, working with me or having me keynote your next event. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. I will see you next week.